Good morning, everybody. Welcome to paper session 15, Human Factors and Ethics. This morning, we will have five of our presentation. Each presenter will have more or less 12 minutes, plus more or less three minutes for answering questions. I remember that you can write your questions on Discord or here on Zoom. I will uh, uh, ask the presenter uh, your, your questions. And uh, remember also to join at your time at the end of the discussion to continue the discussion with the presenters. Uh, our room in get our, time, get our Time will be question and answer track A. Now we can uh, start with uh, the first speaker. The first speaker is Joseph Hohagan. Joseph Hagan is a PhD student at the University of Glasgow. His research interests include augmented reality and virtual reality. And uh, today he will present to us uh, safety, power imbalances, ethics, and proxy sex serving in the wider actions between VR users and bystanders. Please, Joseph. Oh, oh I'll share the screen. Uh... That one, uh, so that should, <clears throat> that should hopefully be full screen now. I uh, should uh, warn everybody that there's a storm going on outside and my internet died about five minutes ago. Here's to be the eye of the storm, so we should probably save for the rest of this. So this is a strange talk, um, as you might guess from the title. Uh, so I've written a suitably strange introduction to the talk. Uh, it is said that all literal roads lead to Rome. However, my hypothesis is that all pathways of the human mind lead only to the attainment of sex or power. Uh, this talk is about sex. This talk is about power. This talk is about surveying in the wild interactions of VR users and bystanders. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Joseph. I'm a PhD student at the University of Glasgow. Uh, I'm, this, I'm the main producer of this work. Uh, however, it would not have been published without the input of my supervisors, uh, Julie Williamson and Mohamed Kamis as well as the insightful insights of uh, Mark McGill. Uh, so to motivate this work, I must motivate my PhD to a degree. Uh, and that is to say, my PhD is focused on this idea of how we increase a VR user's awareness that uh, there are people nearby to them. So you can see a very impressive uh, example of one of these systems on the screen here. This was developed by Mark, uh, where a photoreal uh, version of the nearby person, uh, the bystander, is augmented into the VR user scene in real time. So this is an example of a bystander awareness system. Uh, I will reference these occasionally throughout the talk. Uh, I've done much less impressive work than Mark in this area. Uh, any style of research I would term as preschool industrial research. Uh, but even a fool such as I could see that we lack a fundamental understanding of what and how VR user bystander interactions occur in the wild. Uh, therefore, realizing that there was low hanging fruit to grasp at, uh, I made a leap for this. Uh, and we developed a story survey to get unbiased, unfiltered user accounts of in the wild experiences. Uh, between VR users and bystanders. So uh, for full details on the story structure itself, uh, the, the survey structure itself, I would direct you to the paper uh, because I don't really have time to go into it in detail today. Uh, but in short, we asked a series of questions to obtain qualitative stories uh, about experiences people had had, either as a VR user or as a bystander. We had a thematic analysis on this, and then we just, you know, that was how we got our results. Uh, so like I said, I have more results than time to get through, so I'm being brief on a lot of the details there, and I point you to the paper to see them. Uh, but I would say that we had 100 stories uh, on which we did the analysis from. So that's 100 different people, 100 different experiences and examples they gave. Uh, and we did ask some questions to contextualize our data. Uh, so it was roughly about half and half in terms of who reported as being a bystander in the interaction and who reported as being the VR user. And in the vast majority, the VR user and the bystander claimed that they knew each other uh, beforehand. Uh, we also asked things like, you know, how often people had experienced uh, this type of interaction, you know, between a bystander and a real uh, a nearby person. And we also asked, you know, how frustrated they had been in their interactions, either with a bystander or with a VR user. Uh, and quite surprisingly, we found that uh, people were not at all or, you know, very little and uh, minimally frustrated uh, with these interactions. Um, and this actually goes in the face of a lot of what we were thinking for, you know, the reasons to build these bystander awareness systems. You know, we thought, okay, the interaction is inherently frustrating due to somebody being in VR and not aware, uh, and this, VR, uh, this bystander being fully aware. Uh, but we found that was actually not the case, uh, at least with, with our data. Um, 
So there comes a time in every PhD student's career where they must look in the face of all that's known and say, no. Uh, so I will make a bold claim here, uh, today is my day, where I will say that uh, there are reasons to build bystander awareness systems, but that frustration is not one of them. Uh, and hopefully the rest of the talk will give you a lot of the reasons we should be interested in building these systems. So when we did our analysis, we did look for what types of interactions were occurring uh, in terms of you know, verbal communication or physical contact, right? Physical contact could be something like the, the tap the person on the shoulder, or they hug them or do something with them. Uh, and we found that verbal communication was actually very uh, frequent throughout all interactions. You know, all but five had some element of verbal communication. Uh, and uh, well, you know, this might be a bit stating the obvious, but I'm sure as you're aware, sometimes we have to do that. Uh, so. Uh, so we did when we did when we looked at our analysis. We did look at a you know we tried to find a high level categorization for how interactions occur. And we found there was three main themes. You know this idea of coexisting, uh, demoing, and interrupting. Uh, coexisting is a bit of a catch all. I break it down a bit more in the paper. So, um, but to give a quick summary of it, you know coexisting could be something like two people in the same room. You know talking about something like the weather uh, or sports. Or it could be, you know, uh, a VR user uh, playing in VR and a bystander playing on the TV view. So this kind of collaborative uh, experience. Yeah. And then demoing and interrupting, you know, fairly self-explanatory. I'm sure we've all demoed. I'm sure we all get a good idea of what interrupting is. But I would like to go over interrupting in a little bit more detail uh, because that's very relevant to my work uh, on these bystander awareness systems. So we had that eight uh, interruptions were uh, explicitly said to be surprising by the VR user. Uh, there was a mixture of verbal uh, and uh, physical contact eliciting this uh, surprise reaction. Uh, and we could say that, you know, bystander awareness systems, in a sense, could potentially prevent these, right? They would give them warning that somebody is there before they've walked up and touched them on the shoulder and surprised them. Uh, but what's also interesting is that uh, interruptions are kind of just weird in general. So there was some lab work done in the past by a senior George who looked at this idea of could a bystander identify the optimal moment to interrupt a VR user? Uh, we had one uh, story in which this type of thing was actually described as occurring in the wild. So it was quite interesting to see this empirical evidence of this actually occurring um, in the wild. Uh, so then thinking a little bit about what happens after the VR user is aware that somebody is nearby. Uh, we did see that 19 stories had the VR user transition to some view of reality. So six did this partially, that could be taking off headphones. Uh, 13 did it fully. That could be either engaging a pass-through view to see their entire uh, real-world surroundings, or it could be even taking the headset off fully. Uh, we're not entirely sure what motivated this behavior, uh, but I think it's important because it does actually uh, change how you use a bystander awareness system and what the goal of the system is, right? If the goal is simply to tell them that somebody is there so that they then take off the headset, that's a very different type of system than, it's some, uh, than one that is designed so that it will allow a VR user and a bystander to coexist, right? So at the start, we showed you that photo, uh, the example of like a photo real avatar in VR. That's more of a coexisting one, I guess, uh, where something like a text notification would just give you a quick pop up that somebody is there, and then they would take the headset off to see, okay, and engage with them. Yeah. So I will now transition to what I think is one of the more interesting uh, aspects of our uh, results, uh, potentially probably the most interesting. Uh, and I'll preface this with some philosophy by saying the measure of a man is what he does with power. Um, I'm not here to debate uh, what makes a good man. I'm here to talk about power, uh, specifically between an unaware entity and a fully aware entity. So we start to see this uh, emerge from this, uh, you know, from these 28 stories we had here, in which the bystander said it was their duty to protect the VR user. Uh, 19 reported doing this directly, either by redirecting the VR user away from nearby objects or people, or intervening and moving nearby people away from the VR user. I'm sure you've seen videos of people with have accidentally collided with, say, a wall or nearby people, uh, but these were people who've gone out of their way to ensure that that does not happen. Uh, but we do start to see some level of power imbalance here, right? We have a fully aware bystander and a completely unaware VR user. And uh, we had two more uh, instances of how this could potentially be used uh, or misused uh, for malicious reasons. So we had two stories in which the bystander said they recorded the VR user with their smartphone. They said it was unintended. They did not say it was malicious. They said it was just for fun to show the, the VR user how funny they looked in terms of their emotions. Uh, but we can easily imagine scenarios where malicious uh, reasons are used for doing this. Uh, we also had 12, 12 stories where uh, the bystander improvised this weird, uh, unconventional interaction. So some of these were quite quaint. Uh, we had a bystander surprise feed the VR user a cookie uh, because the VR user was playing in like a sort of a chocolate world kind of like dessert world kind of thing. Uh, but we also had 10 in which the bystander intentionally scared or teased the VR user in some way. Uh, so here's an example of one of those stories. Uh, we had a fully uh, immersed VR user. They were playing in some simulation, uh, some game. 
Uh, and the bystander, realizing how immersed they were, snuck up behind them and just pushed them uh, physically. You know, the VR user was quite surprised. They were quite scared. Um, they were quite, 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 quite scared. Uh, and then the bystander, you know, pointed and laughed, right? Uh, and then when asked about it later, they said, oh, I was just teasing you. I was just joking. Uh, but it's teasing, which is reliant on exploiting the fact that the uh, VR user is unaware and the bystander has full awareness and, in theory, power over them. Uh, but what was, all, what was also even more interesting was that uh, we found that this, this power imbalance can be bi-directional. So uh, this is the weird story. This is the sex story. Um, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, I won't really mull on the nature of what it means to be a person reduced to a haptic proxy. Uh, what I will say, though, is that there's an element of trust here that's involved, and you can see an example of how the role can be uh, switched so that the VR user is the fully aware person and the bystander is the unaware person. So in the scenario here, the bystander was led to believe they were playing a specific avatar in a specific type of game. Uh, but suppose they don't have a view of the VR user scene. The VR user could, in theory, switch the avatar to something else, right? So the bystander has been misled. They think they're one thing, but they're actually something else in VR, right? They think there's some character in this waifu game, they're actually maybe a child or something, right? If the bystander finds out later, how then would they feel if they've, you know, they've uh, in essentially enabled the weird perversions of a strange person, right? It's uh, it's a bit of a weird one. Um, I'm not entirely sure about that, but you know, um, I would like to say that there's much more in the paper. Uh, I would point you to that to read it and potentially cite it uh, if it's interesting to you. Uh, I will sum up uh, by saying that for the first time ever, we investigated uh, in the wild interactions between VR users and bystanders. Uh, we show that bystanders play a very important role and that there exists this power imbalance between them, uh, which can be exploited. And although it's heavily in favor of bystanders currently, it is bi-directional. Uh, that I should end. That's, that's the talk. Thank you very much, Joseph. Um, checking whether there are questions here in the chat or in Discord. I cannot see question yet. In the meantime, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned the fact that uh, there were some situations where the VR users and the bystanders uh, knew each other. Which kind of knowledge? So there are uh, different kind of knowledge. So I may know um, a colleague or uh, relatives uh, and so on. Which kind of knowledge did, did you investigate? Yeah, so and uh, we did look for where the location of where it took place. Uh, the majority were in the home, so it would have been, you know, either friends or family members. Uh, we did see some outside of the home, so there was office, so colleagues there. Um, I think one mentioned a school, so again, you know, colleague acquaintance uh, type level. Um, so a mixture, but the majority probably family slash close friends. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I, I also yeah. think that uh, the results depend also on the kind of situation, uh, on the kind of story. So the kind of story is also affecting the, 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 the level of knowledge and the kind of, so of story are, of course, sweetly related uh, one to each other. Uh, okay, I cannot see other questions. Uh, uh, no, uh, th there is a question uh, with, uh, which is coming. So we can wait a few seconds. Uh, in the meantime, I have another very quick question. Um, you also mentioned that uh, bystanders would try to help the VR users in potentially dangerous situation. Which kind of dangerous situations? Uh, so some of them would be, oh, so there was two there. Um, there was one where it's the, the VR user physically, uh, well, the VR user physically gets redirected, right? So the bystander either grabs the VR user, pulls them back from a wall or a chair or something or a nearby person. Uh, but they also did things where they moved nearby people away from the VR user, right? So they were like, okay, you're standing too close to move back. They might push, uh, they might hit you. Um, so there's multiple ways they were doing it. Okay, thank you. Uh, one question from, the, from Anthony Steed. Was there any variance depending on the type of VR system? For example, a PSVR, which generates bystanders, bystanders views. Okay, so I don't have the, um, the exact headset they used in the situation. Um, you know, some mentioned it, some didn't. They just, you know, because they were, 
some of the situations where people just trying VR and they were giving their experience there. Um, but I would say that I think from the, a lot of them, there was a difference between say the, the more seated stationary PSVR uh, interactions, right? So you have people saying, that, okay, somebody would uh, sit down next to them and they would interact with them that way uh, compared to the, the more room scale type setups where people were discussing things like walking through the play area uh, or negotiating with the person around the play area and the boundaries of that. Um, so there was a bit of difference, I guess. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you, Joseph. I think that uh, we can uh, thank the speaker yeah, and we you. can move uh, to the next speaker. Next speaker is uh, Jill Lee. Jill Lee is a postdoctoral researcher at the Distributed Interactive System Group at the Dutch National Research Institute for Mathematics and Computer Science. She holds a PhD degree in human information communication design from the Delphi University of Technology and is specialized in user experience and human computer interaction research. She is currently working on developing evaluation metric for assessing user experience when users are interacting with, are interacting with immersing the technologies for diverse domain. Now she is going to present us her paper evaluating the user experience of a photorealistic social VR movie. Please, G. Okay, I'll share my screen. Oh, I don't see my. Okay, should be this one. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, we see them. Great. Oh. Strange. Okay, it just shows I'm like a screensaver on my part. Okay, hi, hello, as uh, uh, thank you, uh, Melula, for introducing me. So my name is Jay, and today on behalf of my co-authors, I'm going to present you uh, with this interesting work, evaluating user experience of a photorealistic social VR movie. Um, so imagine you are lying down on a couch with your family or with your loved ones and watch a movie together. It will be a really happy and cozy thing to do. But nowadays, it's not always possible uh, due to geographic distance or pandemic restrictions. But how can we still have the feeling of being together while apart? And so social virtuality uh, provides promising solutions. So social VR recently has uh, attracted attention worldwide as a, a feasible alternative to video conferencing tools, allow multiple users to meet in a shared immersive environment and interact with the environment, environment itself and also interact with the representations of each other. So social VR platforms such, such as Mozilla Hubs, Outer Space has become popular tools for people to, to organize remote events so for, for my ex experience in the past two years, I have been using uh, Mozilla Hubs to, to organize my Kai uh, social VR workshop and went, went very well. Um, and another side is like uh, uh, social VR um, really give opportunities to, to support people's life in many ways. For instance, on the right side, it was also a project I did with a hospital in the Netherlands. So we developed a social VR clinic and that allow patients who has a disability or um, like um, unhealthy patients to stay at home and meet the doctor and receive the training and the medical care um, yeah, without uh, um, um, traveling to the hospital. Okay. Apart from the realistic virtual environments, so from my research, I also found photorealistic representations are equally important to support co-presence and natural intuitive ways of interacting in VR. So many research has found that like, photorealistic representations provides a better sense of uh, co-presence than avatar presentations. So here I'll show you um, a short video. So that's my colleague Janssen, and uh, he has uh, developed a volumetric video pipeline that can uh, captures, constructs, and transmits the volumetric representations of users and objects into a virtual environment. So in this video, you can see that two users and a cake were each captured by three depth cameras and transmitted into the same virtual space. So using this pipeline, uh, it allows us to have a, um, a sense of being together when we count the physical limit. So here is another video just showing you when we 
captured and transmitted uh, the cake and two users in the same virtual space. So actually these two users were at the different cities, but they are able to co-present in a virtual cafe doing high five and blowing out the candles on the cake together. So that was a celebration event for, for our institute. So we did this little project about how to apply social VR in celebration. Um, okay, next one. So in this study, we used uh, uh, Janssen's volumetric uh, video pipeline and a professionally produced social VR movie. So I'll give you an idea what this movie looked like. So this movie is about a murder mystery. Uh, the scenes at the victim's luxury apartment, uh, including a living room, a kitchen, and a bedroom. So at part one of the movie, four users gathered together in the living room. Um, and part two, so two users will be guided to the kitchen while uh, the other two will go to the bedroom. So the users can interact with the movie characters and some objects in the virtual environment. And also they can also use audio and uh, nonverbal uh, communication uh, to, to com communicate with the peers. So the goal of the study is to evaluate um, how user experience this new type of immersive interactive movie. So we would like to answer two research questions. The first one is how do users experience this movie in terms, in terms of quality of interaction, social presence, workload, and how do they rate the re visual representations um, of the photorealistic representation? And the second research question is that what are users' attitudes towards this new experience? So in order to answer the questions, we invited a total of 48 users who came in groups of four persons at a time. So since the movie allows users to access either using a head mounted display or using a screen with game controllers. So we randomly assigned two users to use the HMD and the other two to use the screen. Uh, so in this way, we have a more complete picture of user experiences uh, using different devices. So the study took about an hour, starting from introducing the movie characters and the making sure the participants understood their rights to quit the study at any time. So the movie um, was only 10 minutes. Um, after the movie, uh, participants will be guided to fill in uh, a number of uh, questionnaires. And in the end, the researcher uh, conducted a short group interview and to ask about their overall experience um, in terms of uh, their interactions and uh, um, how satisfactory uh, the representations are and so on. Uh, we used uh, five questionnaires uh, to uh, assess different aspects of user experiences. So simulator sickness questionnaire was uh, filled in both before and after the movie to measure the changes in the level of cyber sickness. And the social VR questionnaire was filled in twice after the movie. One was to measure the experience of movie part one, so where uh, the four people are gathering together. And the second time was to measure the part two so when, when the four users were split into two groups. Um, and the social VR questionnaire is aiming to measure uh, users' conversation, interaction quality, social connectedness, um, and presence immersion experiences. And just, to, um, just uh, we also uh, used a standard presence questionnaire uh, from Whitney Singer just to see, just to make sure uh, we, we have captured the, the, the essence of uh, measuring, uh, comparing the, the presence in the experience. Um, so the, the standard questionnaire has more subscales and so they, they are aiming to measure uh, realism, possibility to, to act, possibility to exam, uh, so many subscales. And NASA task load index was used to measure users' workload during the social VR movie uh, in terms of time pressure, uh, the users feel, felt, um, how they perform in, in, the, uh, in the tasks, and uh, do they feel any frustration while performing the tasks. Uh, and visual quality questionnaire asked the users to rate both their own representation quality and those of others. So um, just, I will only present the main readouts. So if you are inter interested in statistical methods and the detailed analysis, please read out the paper. 
So the, uh, we first found that uh, the social VR questionnaire without reviewed a uh, significant main effect of the movie parts um, on the experience of presence and immersion. So regardless of uh, what device the, the users are uh, used, so they rated presence immersion higher at part two of the movie. So when two users were together in, in either in kitchen or bedroom, then the part one of the movie. Uh, so when four users are gathered in a more spacious um, uh, living room. Um, and we also found that, so um, HMD users, they also rated presence immersion significantly higher than the screen users. Yeah, along with this um, uh, main uh, effects, we also found significant interaction effects between two movie parts and the devices. So uh, you can see from the graph, so the HMD users increased the, the scores for, for presence immersion when they moved from part one to part two. And, but the screen users rated presence immersion similarly at part one and part two. Um, we also find two main, um, two significant main effects of the presence questionnaire. So the first one uh, is that um, we found actually male participants um, rated possibility to act significantly higher than females. So possibility to act are, are questions about how much the users were able to control events, uh, how responsive the environment were or to the actions the users performed. And the second uh, is that the screen users rated the possibility to exam significantly higher than HMD users. So uh, this, this uh, subscale uh, is intended to measure like how closely the users were able to exam objects um, uh, in, uh, from multiple viewpoints or how users can concentrate on their tasks. Um, and in terms of uh, overall uh, workload, HMD users reported heavier task load compared to the screen users. And our interesting findings uh, regarding the, the evaluation of the user representations, so that's uh, their photorealistic hologram. Uh, we found that regardless of gender and devices, the ratings of self representation were significantly lower than the ratings of others. others. So people are generally less satisfied with their own representation. And among the screen users, um, no significant difference was were found between the ratings of self and others. Uh, however, among the HMD users, uh, the ratings of the, the self re uh, representations were significantly lower than the ratings of others. Um, um, a brief uh, results from the interview afterwards. So we identified three themes from the user interview and the analysis. So the majority of users found this new movie experience exciting since they can talk to real people instead of avatars. And however, they also found the movie focused a lot on the narrative, only offered very limited opportunities uh, to interact and communicate with peers and movie characters. And they also find the, the quality of the representation satisfying, which enhanced their co-presence uh, feelings. Uh, they recommended to include multi-sensory experiences, more interaction opportunities uh, in the future uh, development. Yeah, and we are totally aware of the study limitation. For example, the local motion techniques are different between HMD and the screen uh, users just due to the limitation of this uh, commercially produced movie. Uh, but for the purpose of this study, we primed um, the aesthetics and the narrative aspects over the perfectly controlled uh, aspects. So we find this is really important because we can uh, explore a first class movie production and derive important and innovative insights about how users experience it. Um, and we also identified many potential factors that uh, we can investigate further in a controlled manner. For instance, um, uh, how, how, how the influence of local motion methods on cyber sickness and uh, differences in users' movement trajectories uh, and so on. And we also actually in, in this study, we also invited a group of experts and I didn't report in this presentation. Uh, so a group of, of experts used our system and predicted that with uh, arrival of 5G and uh, the seamless uh, photorealistic social VR experiences will have this, uh, a lot of impact in many sectors such as education, museums, medical care, remote collaboration, online dating and virtual tourism. 
Um, and we invite you to read our paper for more interesting findings. And thank you for, for your attention. Thank you, G, for your uh, nice and very interesting presentation. I'm now asking the audience uh, whether there are some questions. Uh, I see that uh, someone is writing on Discord. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I, would ask, I would like to ask you um, something. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, uh, one question about uh, um, you, you, the, the, the timing you choose to perform your experiment. You have said that uh, you uh, show the, for only 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that uh, results will be different for a longer experience or, uh, or, no, or not? Yeah, I, I would foresee a difference, a lot of difference if the movie is longer, like the normal lens, two hours. I think the cyber sickness level will be increased dramatically. Uh, so even uh, in this movie, uh, why there is a, a difference in locomotion technique? Because HMD users tend to get more dizzy if they can move freely in that space. So we restrict them uh, the, their movement by teleportation, so they can only jump between spots, but we allow screen users to, to move freely in the space. So if the movie is more than half an hour, I would say uh, most of the people will feel dizzy. And so this is still the, the, the development way we need to, to, to fix in the future. Thank you. Uh, I have received another question from, from, from the audience, and it is about the Cake on the Table project. Okay. And uh, they would like to, uh, to have a better, a better explanation of how do you create the environment. Uh, so if a user wearing the HMD look around and use mm -hmm. the HD camera to reconstruct the environment surrounding mm -hmm. him, him, and if it is a runtime and an automatic procedure. Uh, so the question is to ask about the virtual environment create. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the question uh, is uh, if uh, you are able to create the virtual environment automatically and, uh, 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 and in real time. Uh, no, the virtual environment is uh, pre-built um, in Unity. So that's a static uh, uh, okay. aspect. Uh, so a 3D environment. But the users uh, are captured and delivered in real time. Okay, okay. So the, 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 the virtual environment is pre-built, but you capture the user, which is, yeah. of course, the important part of, of your work. Okay, I have a, 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 another question from Discord. Uh, we do uh, thank you for the interesting and timely topic about social VR. Perhaps another interesting and relevant topic is a mixer scenario in which some users are co-located and some users are remote. Could you comment a few words about how immersive technique could be involved in this case? And would that be interesting to also involve augmented reality as well? Okay, so that's a big question. Yeah, uh, very interesting question. <laughs> I do think about this issue because we think immersive communication do not necessarily to be remote because it can add to us, um, like um, we can, like I was running this social VR workshop on Mozilla Hubs. So many of the, like my co-organizers, we are actually co-located, but we are entering the VR uh, separately. So um, I noticed that there were, might be some um, um, disturbance uh, between us because of the audio, but um, virtual reality, even during this co-located uh, experience, it still provides us more possibilities to uh, beyond reality. Like uh, when we are watching the keynote talk, we can fly to the middle of the air and in order to get a better view. Um, and But for remote, uh, um, remote uh, uh, experience, the current issue is mainly the, the, the latency, like Sometimes we really see delays when people, are, they already moved their hand, but we didn't hear their audio. So that's still uh, also still disturbing the, the experience and even the, the quality of the photorealistic representation. Now for remote case, that's still the challenge. And for augmented reality, I'm, I'm not really an expert in that field, but I can see 
augmented reality can be uh, more, I guess, more useful for co-located situation. So since we can project something uh, in front of us, we can have a, a, a like a three-dimensional uh, visual information when we are discussing um, our meetings or uh, our projects. So I, I can see that's um, more useful for co-located experience. Thank you very much, G, for your uh your answers and again thank you for your nice presentation and for your very interesting work thank you okay so we can move to the third speaker the first speaker is uh, professor anthony steed anthony steed is a professor at the department of computer science university college london he has broad research interest in mixed reality from hardware design to the longitudinal evaluation of systems. Today, he will present uh, directions for 3D user interface research from consumer VR games. Please, uh, Anthony, you can start. Hello, thank you. Um... Thank you for the introduction. And I'm, I'm presenting this on behalf of myself, uh, Takula Takala, um, uh, Daniel Archer, Wallace Ages, and Bob Linderman. And I would like to say that uh, um, this work got started while I was on sabbatical um, at uh, Rob's lab at the Hit Land, at the Hit Lab in New Zealand. So a lot of this um, got started when I had time to play some VR games. Um, so the main the main observation of the paper or, or the discussion that led to the paper is that millions of hours of uh, time has now been spent in many thousands of VR applications. So this is a snapshot from Steam um, last week showing that there were 4,915 games. Um, and the, the corollary of this is that there's probably more research has been done on you know, usable 3Ds and traction techniques by game designers making these games work than has been done in, the, in, in academia. Um, but of course, they do very different types of work. So the main question that we're asking um, is, is whether we can learn anything from all of these games. Um, but before we get to that, I, we have to frame the, uh, the, the, the question a little bit, um, because at conferences like ISMAR, um, we've seen a lot of what's called 3D user interface research or interaction research. And this has been very broad because it's been over a long period of time. Um, uh, and consumer virtual reality games are relatively narrow specialization in that they're mostly one headset, two hand controllers, and there is usually no opportunity to involve new devices, uh, which is a, a very current theme and very active theme of 3D interaction research is can you, can you make a new device? Um, consumer VR games need to deal with the real world as users find it. And as we heard in one of the previous uh, talks in this session, um, that means that being safe, not using too much space. Um, there may or may not be a bystander to help them. Um, and I've punched the wall right, in, in, in VR um, playing Frisbee in Rec Room. Um, and so they, they, they can't do, games have to stay away from certain types of action and so on. Um, or also they need to deal with restricted spaces. Um, they need to be accessible. So consumer VR uh, content has to um, be usable by people who have little experience. Again, we have a debate afterwards about whether or not it needs to be usable by na naive users. Um, but uh, you do have to cope with explaining your technology. And for example, there won't be somebody to explain how to use your system. Um, it needs to be self-explanatory and therefore a lot of effort goes into tutorials inside the system and the systems have to be learnable. Um, and consumer VR games need to deal with failure cases. It's not, there, there isn't a, somebody, a helpful student there to press the reset key if something goes wrong. Um, if, a, if, a physics, if the physics engine sends a necessary object flying off into the distance, you need to be able to cope with that. And again, there's lots of creative input on, on that um, in consumer VR games, uh, how to cope with these situations. 
Okay, so the research, back to the research questions. The research questions are, what can the academic community learn from this content? And are there any specific things that uh, we can draw out and perhaps establish uh, guidelines for, even put into toolkits, um, or it should just be you know, examined as, as, uh, as alternatives to some of the standard uh, interaction techniques that we tend to promote and use ourselves. In, in, our, in our VR content. Okay, so how do you review uh, all these tens of thousands of experiences? So 4,915 on Steam, um, many more on processes like SideQuest. And of course, if you're doing PC VR, then it's, it's hard to count because you can host your demonstration anywhere. So, the, so we crowdsourced suggestions and we started that a couple of years ago, when I was on sabbatical, posted to various email lists, um, um, Slack channels, some public, some not public, um, I, I'm across academia and across industry for suggestions. Um, that led to uh, creation of a, of a resource, which is on Trello, uh, which is lists of suggestions. And it's a completely open process. So um, a few months ago, we said, let's write a paper about this. So there was an open call for people to contribute. Um, um, so the author of this paper was sort of self-selected. Um, and everything's open source. In fact, if you really want, you can dig into the, the overleaf um, to see how the paper was written. And um, you can see my hack to switch between IEEE format and archive format, uh, which I've wrapped around the IEEE VGCT latex template. Um, so have a look at those URLs. They're posted in, in on Discord as well if you want to see the suggestions. <clears throat> so there are 20 suggestions in the paper. I will quickly uh, talk about five now. And there are the paper discusses 42 consumer applications that demonstrate these 20 suggestions. And this suggests a range of things from this is a nice technique to um, why doesn't everybody do, do this? There are 19 um, further suggestions of things that could be looked at in Trello. So they didn't make the cut for the paper. The paper would have been too long as the journal paper. Um, there's a little bit more supporting discussion on, on the Slack about uh, what is the user interface technique? Um, what should we be reporting? And there are some things which we found are very interesting but not generalizable. And there's a motto on the Trello, which is um, no exit burritos, um, which is a, a, a very nice interaction technique, but not very generalizable. And it's from the game Job Simulator. Um, and there are some reflections on Trello and in the paper about this crowdsourcing process and suggestions for other areas where it might be done. So to get into the five suggestions, <clears throat> um, um, they, they range across the, the, the full sort of taxonomy of 3D user interface, um, so selection, manipulation, locomotion techniques, and then system control. And then a, a fifth category, category we added, which is sort of dealing with the real world, um, which is this aspect of VR applications, which doesn't um, come across too much in prior work. Um, so um, that, that's an interesting debate in itself. Should it be a, you know, a common act, a common part of taxonomies. So here's an example. So this is a uh, uh, so type of selection technique and I'm grabbing technique. It's called, we, we've labeled it intention preservation. And it comes from the game Bullet Train. And, and, and a particular explanation we draw upon is a game, is a talk given by the developers at a game developer conference. So in Bullet Train, the, the, you have to pick up a lot of items, guns, things thrown at you, grenades and so on. You have to do this very quickly. And, but you also have to watch where you're going. So you don't have the luxury of being able to, you know, look where you want to grab things all the time. So it really emphasizes that difference that actually hand-eye selection isn't appropriate <clears throat> because things aren't coming to, aren't necessarily heading towards your head. And um, hand pointing selection isn't appropriate either because um, things are moving very fast. So well, relatively fast. So. Um, so what they do is just a compromise, and it's a sort of very simple compromise, which is they use uh, a ray between the hand pointing and the hand eye axis, and this is this is perceived. But they claim that the the users perceive this to be more around what they intend. So it's a sort of ray that's sort of halfway between 
pointing and up eye direction. And that's really interesting because that's very amenable to somebody running a study on it. Is it faster? Is it more intuitive um, um, than, than other techniques? Um, because it, the game developers, well, obviously they used it in the game, but they claim that in their, their own testing, people found this to be the most intuitive. Okay, so that's, that's uh, the first suggestion is very direct, very amenable um, to, to experimentation. And as we explained in the paper, some of these things are, you know, they, they lead to pro paper suggestions. They lead to sort of, let's say, if, if I had infinite PhD students, one of them could study this um, directly and, and see if it is true. Or is there something specific about the game context that makes this technique uh, preferable? Um, but it's not, it's not um, um, a completely general technique. Um, the second, the second one we've pulled out is one of my favourites. Um, it's called Tomato Presence, um, and uh, it was called this by Alchemy. Uh, Alchemy, the, the 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 developers of Job Simulator. And so, when you pick up an object in Job Simulator, your hand disappears. Um, and to me, that's really quite controversial because of all this work in in our community that talks about body ownership. <clears throat> the sense of embodiment and lots of work on what your hand looks like. And here's a system where your hand doesn't look like anything a lot of the time. Uh, but in a blog post, Alchemy claim that most people don't notice their hand disappears. And that's fascinating because it um, the sensor motor contingencies of your hand are still there. Because when you pick up the sugar pot in this case, when you move your hand, you see the sugar pot move, not your hand. Um, but you still see the, the match. Now, of course, you could also you could be a little bit more negative. This is this is a good hack if you if you want to pick up objects, but you don't want to draw the hand shapes for picking up objects. Um, but um, you know, this is one of my master's student projects um, uh, from the last couple of years. Is does it have an impact on body ownership? So there you go. Hopefully, that'll be written up soon. Um, the third technique is is it's not a novel suggestion. Um, there are plenty of demonstrations in content, VR content over a very long time um, that have uh, the, the, the world or the user be scalable. So you can scale yourself up and down. Um, but the opportunity here is it, it, there are many ways of doing that. And there might be some, the, some, some the, this is sort of an area where it's very tempting to write a taxonomy of all the ways that it is done and which are the most effective to explain scale change and um, the mechanism for it and how far you should scale and so on. There's, there's new results on this recently, including one that Mark Gonzalez talked about in the in a, her keynote um, about um, how people perceive distance over when they change scale. And uh, here's a game called The Spy Shrunk Me, but we could also mention Tilt Brush and we mentioned a few others in the in the paper where you can change your scale and this is this is facilitates tasks. But here there's an opportunity for somebody to do something which sort of tries to establish the best, you know, the, the guidelines for this to, to implement it effectively. The, the fourth suggestion is again um, um, not, not novel um, um, in, the, in that uh, you can find prior art on this, but the, the whole idea of body centered menus and um, in the game Lone Echo, you have uh, menus attached to the body. This is very, um, um, consistent with the, with the metaphor of the game, which is very futuristic. So you can imagine this is augmented reality, virtual reality, pretending to be augmented reality. Um, and so this might be appropriate for certain types of menu which are centered on yourself rather than in the world. So again, the suggestion here is that there's a, there's somebody should review this and see when, where the, where menu should be located depending on the function. And the final suggestion is uh, from the paper is, it's just examples of independent visual backgrounds. So there's drawing in literature from, from visual psychology um, that having a, a stable background helps to simulate a sickness. Uh, and just to point out that this is found everywhere in games, including, for example, Elite Dangerous, where you see the cockpit of your spacecraft as a background all the time. This, this, this may or may not help with, uh, with stability, with simulator sickness. Okay, so we're not claiming, so in summary, we're not claiming these techniques are completely new, but they are all very promising and it's really interesting that they're being used. Um, um, the paper lists exam more example research questions um, and we've tried to focus on reusable techniques um, that might be used in future toolkits. 
And in conclusion, the paper tries to make a bridge between the varied imaginative design of consumer VR applications and uh, the community's research. Uh, and we crowdsourced it because of the vast, num vast material out there. And we hope it has some suggestions uh, to follow up. And it's all open. So if somebody wants to take on the baton and write a follow up, you're very welcome. Thanks very much. Thank you, Anthony, for your very interesting talk. I'm checking whether there are questions from the audience. Okay, there is uh, one, uh, one question uh, which is uh, coming. In the meantime, uh, I'm, I'm asking you, I don't know, not really a question, maybe a comment. It is very interesting, your talk. Uh, uh, in a certain sense, is uh, against uh, a, a line of research which is trying to uh, develop and implement the so-called natural uh, interaction techniques. So there is a line of research which is trying to mimic what we do in the real world, in the real environment, and just to try to translate such kind of techniques inside the VR uh, or augmented reality system. Now you have, you have uh, um, discussed some examples which, which are against these, uh, these paradigms. So the, the interaction techniques that, uh, for example, the one uh, when you grab an object, the hand disappear, is not what happens in the real life, uh, but it is effective since people are able to, to use it. So it, it, it would be interesting also to evaluate why, why um, uh, they, they choose such kind of interaction and which, which are the differences with, with, with respect to a natural interaction uh, counterpart. Yeah, yeah so, I think, so, so some of that, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good point and, and we do touch on it a little bit in the paper, uh, which is that um, the main thing is that the, the game developers just want it to work. They just want the game to be usable. So yes, they might start with a natural interaction technique, but then they have to cope with all the real world issues. Um, so there's a, there's a lovely example in the paper, which is um, the game, I expect you to die, um, for example. Uh, and, and Jesse Shell's game um, has given several talks on how to make his games usable. Uh, and that's by, you know, they start off with a very naturalistic metaphor you, you're always reaching things, it's set on a chair, you have to reach things in, but then you have to pick things up at a distance. So they had to select a technique for, for distance and they, they, you know, they possibly reinvented the bendy ray, yeah. right? So, um, because they can't have people walk because uh, the game was originally developed for Oculus, the first Oculus Rift. So it's only only small amount of head tracking. So it's really interesting. And it's, uh, you might have a naturalistic metaphor that game certainly does, but it, it just encounters, the, the boundaries of that all the time um, um, of, of implementing that in, re, uh, in that we don't have large volumes, we don't have hand finger positions and so on. So um, they don't, obviously game developers, they, 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 their, their main aim is to make it fun and make it usable. Um, so the usability doesn't get in, in the way of the fun. Um, and so they, they just made a very, very, uh, um, um, brutal about selecting techniques and throwing them away if they don't um, if they don't work yeah yeah, yeah. so also the, the aspect of having fun is is of course important and uh, it is under the choice of uh, of people um i have an, uh, no, a question from from discord uh, Wade Zulu is uh, thanking you for the very interesting talk. And he was wondering in your survey, did you find some novel ways regarding current VR games manage the views, interfaces, content layout? Are they mainly sticking with the reality experience or the WIMP paradigm? Or is there anything which is way beyond the reality? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great observation. Um, um, we, we, there is actually a bit of framing which I left out due to time, which is some games use what you might call diegetic um, interface and some use a non-diegetic interface. So that term is used quite commonly in the games industry. It actually comes from the um, um, movie sound effects industry, which is, sound in, uh, which is things in the scene or things which are sort of out of the scene. 
So a, a game like Job Simulator, uh, sorry, um, like I Expect You to Die, has all the interface as props in the world. So if you want to select a level in that game, you, you pick a, a film canister, you stick it in a film projector, and then it switches game. Or the game Job Simulator, you pick a game cartridge, you stick it in a, in a games console and you play the game. And this is completely opposite to something uh, like Beat Saber, where everything is a shiny menu on a, on a screen, on a big screen in front of you. It's like an uh, AR display. So there, there's sort of, there are the sort of very clear distinctions. And then um, the diegetic, where things are in the world, is very just, it's just design, right? I mean, it's how do you make it look, you, your style, your ergonomics, it's architecture and, and product design. Um, so there's more, there's more to raise this question when you come to this sort of, let's come up with a better windowing system, which is large, because um, there are a variety of what, variety of different styles there. Um, if you think of a, of a system like Rec Room, it's got two competing styles at the moment because they're halfway through re-engineering it. And so, yes, there's, 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 there's different styles and there's, yes, there's lots of analysis to do there on what is most effective. Um, so is approximate, uh, approximate tabletop like interface better than a, uh, than a, a wall size interface at a distance? Um, so, so all I can point out is there's, there's lots of different examples. And again, the designers have just done it from scratch, right? So there, isn't, there aren't any guidelines to follow here. Um, and um, every platform, has, every game has a wide variety of different ways of doing this. All, all the platforms all have a very distinct way, distinctive way of doing it. Um, and there aren't there are toolkits to help with that, but there are there aren't very sophisticated yet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anthony, for uh, your answers and your very interesting talk. So thank you again. Okay, I think that uh, we can uh, move to the third talk. Bye bye. The speaker is uh, Diego Montero. He finished his PhD at the Tian Yatong Liverpool University, where he explored several aspects of VR and games, particularly enjoyment, cyber sickness, and ethics. He has recently joined Birmingham City University as a lecturer. Today, he will present to us the paper Using Trajectory Compression Rate to Predict Changes in Cyber Sickness in Virtual Reality Games. Let me share my screen. And I assume you are all seeing me? Yes, we are and seeing your screen. Perfect. So, uh, hello everyone. As I have been presented, I'm Diego Montero, and I'll be talking about um, trajectories and how they relate to cyber sickness. This is a great collaboration among uh, great institutions. And for some reason, I could not change my screen. Okay, uh, why is this research important? Well, cyber sickness is a problem in virtual reality. Uh, we are still figuring out how to get rid of it. And to understand it better, um, we need to uh, be able to evaluate it. And to be able to evaluate it, we have expensive measures or measures that are intrusive or that can be complicated to do. And um, they can, for example, um, be very long, a list of questionnaires. Um, and so it's very hard to understand uh, simulator sickness or cyber sickness as unknown. And why is this research uh, I apologize, I had a slight problem here. And I'll be right back. We don't but see your screen anymore. Yes, I had a slight problem here. Um, it will be back in a second, I'm sorry. Um, It, it was working a second ago. Yes, I tested. Um, I'm should be better now. Okay. Yes. Well, let's do like this. That's because it was not working properly. Well, um, so why is this research important? Uh, and it brings the idea that 
there might be a correlation. My work brings an idea that there might be a correlation between the trajectory compression and cyber sickness. Trajectory compression is when you have uh, a, tra a trajectory, uh, a set of points, and the straighter the points are, the easier it is to compress it. And the straighter path is, it might lead to lower levels of cyber sickness. So we imagine that there might be a correlation. And if there's a correlation, indeed, um, could we use machine learning to identify cyber sickness or changes in it, why it's happening, or uh, maybe to predict it based on the user's behavior in game. But um, I was getting ahead of myself. Um, first of all, cyber sickness, uh, we don't completely understand where it comes from. Uh, we have theories, a lot of theories, and we have pretty good explanations, but uh, it's still an open topic of investigation. And, but one thing that uh, I found while I was learning about cyber sickness, while, while I was reading, is that it's uh, associated uh, with the illusion of movement. And more importantly, uh, when you have the illusion of movement in more than one direction, uh, or that is in 3D, um, you have a greater sense of sickness. So the more you move, um, the more you are likely to get um, cyber sick. And there are many techniques uh, to try to identify your level of sickness. For example, you we can use questionnaires like this simulator sickness questionnaire. We can use the virtual reality sickness questionnaire. And they uh, have been mostly validated. And we have on the mark, you can mark your discomfort score in a in a scale from zero to 10, or in some cases from zero to 20, telling us how much discomfort uh, you have since you started the experiment or you started playing uh, the game. And of course, these are interesting metrics, but they require you to have finished uh, the game or to interrupt the game to be able to uh, disclose them. Or you can do these measurements using physiological and psychophysiological metrics. Uh, that is, you can add an EEG to someone's head, you can use uh, galvanic stim stimulation to measure this, uh, how sweaty they get uh, and see how that relates to cyber sickness. And there are very good methods to detect uh, cyber sickness uh, using these psychophysiological metrics, but they can be, uh, but they can be intrusive. And um, you, it's very hard to make use of them in, in the wild in, in the wild setting you cannot just leave EEGs on everyone's head and expect them to play uh, in their homes and then you collect the data it would be a very hard thing to do um, and now escaping from that uh, let me explain a bit about movement representation and that's something I studied a lot during my masters and you can represent movement in very different ways even though as humans we generally understand movement pretty intuitively, it's difficult to represent it in a computer setting. Um, we can use um, vectors, flow networks. They don't represent um, where the person is at the moment, but they represent where they're going. Uh, we can use equations of motions, and this require a lot of pre-processing. They can be uh, very small for storage, but they require a lot of pre-processing, so they are adequate. Uh, one of the most popular or at least common ways to store movement is through the use of trajectories. That is a set of points uh, annotated temporally. And similar to this, you have your position in X, Y, Z, and then the time where they were happening. And um, when you have a straight line, it's easier to compress because um, you can just eliminate the points in the middle. Uh, whereas when you have curves, you have to determine uh, what would con be considered a straight path and eliminate the points that are um, beyond this threshold. Um, but still, in this case, um, if you are just considering the points, uh, you might miss important aspects of the sickness or movement such as speed. So when you are comp when people are starting to study how to compress trajectory, uh, one of the first methods used was Douglas Poiker, 
that is used for uh, line simplification. It's used a lot in, for map simplification. And we did not consider the temporal aspect. But then Merat and B, they suggested a technique that they're going to, based on the two existing points, they're going to see where the third one should be expected. And if this third one uh, is not where it should be expected, they eliminated the second one and then they use the new one. And they keep doing this uh, until you have had enough points to create. And because they are basing the third one on the already existing points, uh, this can be done online. It can be done as the program runs. It can be, you don't have to have all the data to be able to compress. And that's why we used it uh, in our studies for simplification. So because it's harder to compress uh, when you have curves and when you have curves, you are more likely to get sick. We imagine there is a negative correlation between the compression rate and the cyber sickness. And we imagine that changes in compression rate may, might be able to infer than the changes in cyber sickness. That is, if people start changing how they move, that might indicate that they started feeling some kind of discomfort and that's why they started changing their movements. Just at that, um, we used uh, two different kinds of maps. One that's a maze that they could walk around. We use that for collecting the points. And in this one, they could not change their speed. In the second one, we created a kind of race game that they just should go around the obstacles, the red obstacles. In this one, they could change their speeds. And we just wanted to see if we could see these correlations in different kinds of environment. And to collect how they were feeling, um, we used uh, this scale between zero and 10 on how bad they were feeling since they started uh, playing the game. Um, this would be collected every uh, two minutes. And of course, we would log their positions and time so we could uh, calculate uh, the, the compression. Uh, in this experiment, we had um, young adults and they were all healthy. Most of them did not have experience with VR. And uh, we were able to see that there was not much of a difference um, between the score and the maze. There were some difference, but uh, they were not as relevant to the work. What we observed that was uh, the most important uh, was that there was some level of correlation between uh, between the compression and the cyber sickness. However, it was not as we had expected. But still, as there was a correlation, we decided to run a very simple uh, multi-layer perceptron that was already included in the statistical analysis software. And we were able to, to have very good um, predictions um, for when the cyber sickness would go up or down. Uh, we did not have much data that in which the cyber sickness was stable. And that might be one of the reasons why our data was not so good for to detect stability. But that led us to believe we could uh, use more advanced techniques and that wonder if we could do this for different scenarios. So we did a second experiment uh, in which we had more participants coming over four days and their ages varied between 20 and 47. Uh, we had one participant who was a 47 year old lady. She dropped out on the last day for personal reasons uh, not related to the experiment, but her data was still usable until the third day. Um, because uh, what happened was that in the first two days, uh, we collected the discomfort data and the compression uh, rate for training. We then trained in neural network. We then, um, on the third day and the fourth day, we evaluated if we could predict how their compression was going to go. We only collected them, their discomfort score, so we could compare and see if our prediction was matching what they were reporting. And in the third day, 
day we record it. Uh, in the first two days, we record it in one setting. In the third day, we test it in the same setting. And on the fourth day, we test it in a different setting, but with the data trained from the previous two days. And in here, we have the models that we trained. In the first two days, we trained with the maze from the previous experiment. And in day four, we tested part of the uh, participants in one of these mazes and the other in the mansion. And uh, what we observed is that uh, our prediction matched pretty closely uh, to what had been reported by the participants. And it didn't matter if it was in day three for the same participant or for different, for different participants or for different days, oh, that is for different environments, we had pretty close um, results. And overall, Indeed, the error for the same environment was the smallest. It was less than 2% of a difference uh, overall when we integrated um, the discomfort that was reported by all the participants and the one that had been predicted. And it was only 7% of difference when we compared um, between uh, predicted and reported in a different environment. Um, when we used our hyperparameters, we based on a bit of trial and error in the beginning, based on what I had studied before in my master's and uh, what we had studied in other experiments. We still need to see if other hyperparameters would give better results, if they would be more efficient, faster. And of course, we had a limited sample size. Um, however, uh, we see that somewhat as a positive because uh, if we were able to get such good predictions with a smaller sample size, we might be able to get even better predictions uh, when we can train the data better. And uh, I would like to emphasize that this data is for individual participants. These results are for individual participants. Uh, other predictions are for the same person as it was trained before. It is not a generalizable algorithm. Um, I would like to thank my participants and the funding. Thank you very much. Feel free to contact us should you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diego, for your nice presentation. I'm checking whether there are uh, questions here or on uh, Discord. Uh, in the meantime, I have a, a quick question. Uh, 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 about your methods, you 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 discuss that, that you have a very limited sample. But if you are able to predict with a, a limited sample, there are it is likely to have a, a better results by increasing the the sample size. Um, I have some some curiosity, uh, some technical curiosity. Um, you you have used the quick score for uh, for the discomfort, so it is a, a general uh, measurement of discomfort. Uh, have you tried to use a more complex measurement, for example, the SSQ that I know that is very long, but maybe taking into consideration various um, form of discomfort, for example, eye strain, sickness, disorientation, and so on? Um, we, uh, in the first part of the study, when we're doing a preliminary study, uh, we did use the SSQ and we, uh, we got a pretty reasonable correlation between the SSQ and the discomfort score. And be because uh, the getting the SSQ later was a bit fed, uh, it was harder for the participants. They got tired. Uh, we decided not to use because we had already a good correlation. Yeah. Um, but one thing that was interesting was that after uh, we were able to get a pretty good correlation in these preliminary studies in the first part of the study, but when participants played for a long time, um, the SSQ started to break down. It was not reflective to what participants were reporting verbally to us. Uh, and when we did the 15 minute study, um, the SSQ worked perfectly. But when the participants came back, um, they reported higher levels of sickness than what they were able to report on the SSQ. But we thought it was interesting and might be relevant to someone. But yeah, indeed, it uh, is. We, we will present this. 
Yes, indeed, it's, it's, it's like a, a, an interesting result, and uh, it, it shows the, the limitation of questionnaire like the SSQ. Yeah. Thank you very much, Diego, for your presentation. Thank you. So we can uh, move to the last talk for this session. The speaker is uh, Zing Zhu, is a master's student in the School of Computer and Science at the Beiyang University in Beijing, Ch China. His research interest, interests include virtual and augmented reality and computer graphics. Today, he will present to us a paper, a partially sorted concentric layout for efficient level localization in augmented reality. So, please, Zing. Oh, hello. Uh, thanks for introduction. Hello, everyone. I am Zi Jing Zhou from Beihang University, Beijing, China. Our paper is a partially sorted concentric layout for efficient label localization in augmented reality. This work is together with Lili Wang from Beihang University and with Wai Ku Papesku from Purdue University. Labels can help a user better understand the scene in augmented reality applications. However, the unsorted label layout prevents users from quickly locating specific labels. For example, in the right image, the user needed to check all the labels to find the TPO. We hope to solve this problem through real-time sorted label layout in AR. Most of existing work on label layout focus on visual effects and not, not optimized for the efficiency of finding labels. For example, Medicine et al. proposed an AR real-time label layout method with, which based on geometric constraints. Bittner et al. optimized the labeling problem on the models with per perspective effects. This method takes into account the visual overlap and the opacity of objects. The unsorted label layout can the sorted label layout can improve the efficiency of users searching for specific label, but the sorted label layout will cause the lead line intersect making it difficult for user to check, check anchor point. We propose a label layout that allow user to find a label faster. The label are arranged in concentric circles. The labels on each circle are sorted. Circles sorted clockwise are showing green and the counterclockwise in red. The circle thickness decrease from the first to the last label. Since the label are sorted, the user can quickly check each circle for the given label. When the application allows, the label can be pre-sorted to further reduce the number of circles. Here, after pre-sorting, the three-circle layout becomes a two-circle layout. This is the pipeline of our method, which is mainly divided into three steps. One, single circle and sorted layout. Two, sorted concentric layout. Three, eliminated the intersection of lead lines. And the end option, label pre-sorting. The first step is a single circle and sorted layout. Here is an engine. The red point is the center of the engine. Yellow point are ink points. A, B, 2, I are the labels. Left image shows the spring system. First, the label is initial initialized to be placed along the direction of the anchor point, which indica indicated by black dot line. In order to ensure that the labels are not too dense, there will be a repulsive, repulsive force between the labels to ensure that the label will not too far away from the anchor point. The initial direction will have an attractive force on the label. For example, for label G, there is an attractive force IG pointing to the initial direction and the repulsive force RGD and RGJ from adjacent labels. Right image shows the result of the spring system. After obtaining the unsorted layout, look for the longest sorted subsequence in the unsorted label on the circle, where it can be sorted counterclockwise or clockwise. 
The label corresponding to the longest sorted subsequence obtained in each iteration are arranged in the same circle, and the radius of the circle gradually increases. That is, more labels are distributed in the inner circle. In this case, the longest sorted subsequence find on the circle on the left image is AEFGHIL, which is a clock sorted, clockwise sorted sequence. These labels are arranged in the inner circle with green, indicating that the circle is in a clockwise order. The remaining labels, B, C, D, J, K, form a counterclockwise sorted sequence arranged on the outer circles, indicated by red. When the labels are distributed on circle of different radius, the lead line may intersect. A pair of corrective force is defined for each pair of labels with, with intersecting lead lines. The pair corrective, corrective force are tangent to the circle of the layout. With direction data, directions that pull the labels to each other, aiming for the label to switch place to eliminate the lead line intersection. The force in, increase from iteration to iteration until the lead line intersection is removed. In this case, the lead line D and H intersect and the corrective force FHD and FDH is used to eliminate the intersection. Right image shows the final result. When the application permits, the layout can be further improved by pre-sorting which result a small number of circles, circles layout. In this case, labels ANG, SMG, and OCG could be pre-sorted by prefixing the label string with an index number to one ANG, two SMG, and three OCG. For pre-sorting, we then sample the up some hemisphere of the object. For each sampling point, record the layout sequence of the anchor point's projection on the wheel plane. The Im image on the right shows the wheel of the sampling point which marked in green in the left image. In this wheel, in position one, A in position one, D in position two, K in position three, this sequence is recorded. After recording the sequence of all sampling points, according to the frequency of each label, appearing in different positions. The Grady algorithm is used for pre-sorting. With the help of Erdo strict theory in a study in the case of cyclic sequence, we calculate the upper bound of the number of circles in different number of label case. For a circle of length S, at least a sorted subsequence of length L mean could be found. That is, each time we can take the se sequence of length L mean from the circle. The number of times that all elements in the circle are taken is the maximum number of circles. We also use program simulation to estimate the average number of circle in different number of labels case. Here are result of our method. The left image shows the unsorted single circle layout. The middle image shows the me our method without pre-sorting. And the right image sh shows our method with pre-sorting. We have conducted a user study to evaluate our label layout visualization with, uh, with, uh, and, uh, without pre-sorting by comparing it to an unsorted single circle layout. Here are three conditions. CC is conventional single circle unsorted layout. EC1 is our method without pre-sorting. EC2 is our method with pre-sorting. The task was to find A labels, one at a time, in each of three conditions, in each of two scenes. The brain model, which had a total of 12 labels, and the airplane model, which had a total of 10 labels. After each task, the user had to fill out the questionnaires. 
our objective metric is time to find the labels. Our subjective metric is task load questionnaire and the usability questionnaire. This figure shows the average time that takes for user to find a label in different conditions, whether in brain or airplane scent. The average time of our method is significantly lower than control condition. The average time of our method with pre-sorting is significantly lower than without pre-sorting. This figure shows the task load score in different conditions. Whether in the brain or airplane scene, the task load of our method is significantly lower than control conditions. The task load of our method with pre-sorting is significantly lower than without pre-sorting. We design a usability questionnaire with nine questions. After user fill out the questionnaire, we count the score of each question and calculate the overall score. This figure shows the usability questionnaire score of each question and the overall score in different conditions. Our method has significantly higher score in Q1, Q3, QA, and Q9 than the control conditions. The overall score of our method is significantly higher than the control conditions. The overall score of our method with pre-sorting is significantly higher than the without pre-sorting. Here is our conclusion. We have presented a method for displaying labels in AR application that makes it easier for users to find the specific labels. One limitation is our method require more screen real estate than single layout. Another limitation is our approach prefers short label text string to avoid obscuring too much of the object. Our method applies to the outside look in visualization scenario with the single object of interest that can be surrounded by its labels. Future work should be extended more challenging inside looking out visualization scenario with the user immersed in the scene of interest. That's all, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Z, for your nice and interesting presentation. We have a few questions in Discord. One question is how to determine the repulsive force and attractive force in your method? Or do you mean how to determine the repulsive force? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, have, I, I have read the, the question, but I think that uh, the, the attendee would like to know how you determine the, the forces, the, the repulsive and the destructive forces. Uh, uh, these forces are determined by the direction of the labels on the circle. Uh, the smaller direction angle between the labels, the greater the repulsive force, the greater the angle between the label and the initial direction, the greater the attractive force. Okay, thank you. Uh, 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 there are some other questions. Uh, I would like to select one which I find, find very interesting. Um, I was wondering how to generalize the results for the level layout in augmented reality as mounted display, especially considering the users have the stereoscopic perspective. Yes, the stereoscopic perspective is an interesting aspect. But I think that maybe you can also... Uh, join the discussion later. Another quick question. What happens? Our, uh, okay, okay. Uh, our method can also use in HMD. Okay. It is possible to use in HMD, so stereoscopic uh, uh, aspect is not a problem. And uh, last but not least question. Uh, what does it happen when the user abruptly move? So if the, the user is moving, uh, what happens to your labels, to the labels of uh, the, uh, the, especially when it shake abruptly? Oh, 
um, to avoid the uh, frequent small change to the layout. Uh, the layout is updated only if the uh, user will translate a significantly amount or if the previous layout result in lead line intersection in the uh, create, create view. Okay. And there is one last question. How about the situation when target objects are not attached to a surface, but if they are floating in the air? Oh. Oh. I, think, I think it's okay, it's uh, no problem. Okay. We would like to thank you, Zing, again, and all the speaker of this uh, session. Uh, now there is uh, the question and answer session on Getter Town. Uh, you can uh, join the question and answer track A room. And to do this, you can find a message in the chat as well. You can uh, follow um, Michele Gatullo. Uh, so you will be um, automatically uh, teleported to the, uh, to the room. So see you in Gatcher Town. I would like to thank you everybody again. Uh, thank you for your uh, nice presentations uh, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>